Thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, yeah, so really excited to give a little bit of a different talk than I normally do about this project, this eight year project. Um, I'm going to talk a lot if I can. And, and again, hopefully you guys can ask questions if I'm there's something else you're curious about or, or something you want me to elaborate on. But a little bit of behind the scenes of like why we conducted it, how we conducted it, um, and some approaches that we took and lessons learned. Oops. Okay, first thing, I just need to quickly just make sure we're on the same page because I used two words there in the title slide, replication and rep reproducibility. Uh, since we've done this project, there's a lot, I think, of formality that has occurred to help us with the terminology. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. I just want to make sure that I'm on the same page with everyone, what I mean by replication. So I'm going to take this from the Turing way. I think this is a nice, simple way of looking at it. The project that I'm about to talk about looks at that replicability bin, right? Trying to do the same or similar analyses using different data, new data. So that's what we did. We used the word reproducible when we first you know, presented and proposed the project. Uh, since then, I think uh, collectively, we've done a better job at trying to like sort through the terminology. So that's just first thing, just a little clarification. So motivation. So why did we do this project? Um, so this is the one big reason, right, which is what came out of pharma, which is, hey, there's a problem going on. These are two papers that at the time were really important, and they were just lacking detail, right? So this was a big motivation of the project. Something's going on. Individuals are having a hard time replicating, getting similar results, but we don't know what that means, and we don't know why. So to me, it gets into this bigger motivation. Oh, um, oops. This bigger motivation, which is, what are the challenges in kind of our, our current systems of conducting research and sharing it, right? So like, is there challenges in the process? And what's, so what's basically working well, what's not working well? So that, that to me was a big motivation of trying to conduct this project. It was also, how do you assess credibility, right? It's easy to say it's not replicable. It's much more important and harder, I think, to say, what does it mean to be replicable? I'm not going to dive too far into that. I think that's an interesting topic, but this was a motivation for why we did the project, especially for me. And then the last one I think that's important, and again, I'll show some of that in the slides, is it's kind of a chance to engage, get people to actually not just discuss what it means to be replicable open, but how do you actually engage in practicing transparency and rigor and replicability? Um, so hopefully we did that in the process as well. One more thing is, is there's lots of approaches in terms of how to do, I think, large scale projects, crowdsource projects, which is what we did here. Um, this is a bit of an overview of something that there's many other ways to kind of think about this, but this is kind of a way to think about how do you do collaborative projects um, that invite other people in some capacity. Um, ours fits on, kind of fits way up there in this corner, which is it was a bit of a selective project in the sense that we chose which papers that we were interested in, and we also uh, did a lot of communication ourselves, right? It wasn't um, a large crowdsourced project where, you know, the crowd itself is engaged in the, the conversation and the direction that it goes. So this, just to kind of put in context and something, again, we can go into, which is there's lots of different cool projects. This one kind of fits very neatly into certain individuals invited and a lot of uh, communication kind of done by the project members themselves, myself included. Okay, a little background of, of what's involved. So, one key part was just how to do the project. Um, we were lucky in the sense that we got funding. That's the first piece. So definitely need funding. <laughs> uh, Lauren John Arnold Foundations are the ones that did this. Uh, they're now called Arnold Ventures. So they're a US-based philanthropic group. We also needed to have someone do the experiments, right? We're collecting new data, as I just gave in that definition. Science Exchange was our partners there. Uh, I'll go a little bit more into detail in terms of the breadth that we uh, used their um, network for, but that basically gave us a network of technical experts. So that was the approach we took was we're not going to engage academic labs. We're actually going to engage, you know, crowdsourced um, providers, technical experts. Um, and then the last piece was also besides the coordinators, which is COS, is publication. We wanted to make sure we got that out there. And so eLife was our partner there. Uh, that was some negotiation we did. We debated whether to do this actually um, early on was should we, how do, how do we want to communicate these results? Should we do it just by ourselves and then maybe try to write a paper up at the end? We know how hard it can be to publish null results, replication results. So we actually decided to partner with eLife and use the registered report model that I'll, I'll demonstrate just for clarity for those not familiar. 
Um, to us, we thought that was important because it meant we could really get everything out there in the open. Um, and it also kind of gave us a little bit of a, a way to use the peer review process to kind of also hold us accountable in terms of what we said we were going to do. So that was a, a negotiated decision that we did early on in the project. Uh, I'll just one more note just before we go on. eLife was the partner we chose. We did explore other partnerships as well, but this was the most aligned. eLife was very committed to doing this project with us. Um, so that was a, a really important decision that we made early in the project. So if one wants to, if you're not familiar with it, one thing that we did is we kind of wrote an introduction that kind of outlined the project. I'm not going to go too far into that. I will pull from some of that in this presentation, but you can go there and read more. So basically early on, uh, the reproducibility initiative, the Brazilian reproducibility initiative too, they did this as well, right? What are we trying to do? I think this is actually important because it means um, we had to hold ourselves accountable. We're trying to be as transparent in the process as much as possible, not just the results, but actually what we intended to do versus what we actually did. Happy to, to dive in deeper if people want to know the um, kind of lessons learned from that process. And again, we published almost two years ago now the final papers that came from it. And they're kind of two bins, it's challenges and outcomes. I'm not going to go into this, um, but kind of the high level here is there are challenges. Not a lot of sharing occurs. Uh, and uh, that makes it very difficult basically to attempt to do replications, which is if you're lacking data and materials, it really kind of puts a, a pretty big um, uh, blocker in the entire process. And then even for the ones we could finish, they didn't always uh, replicate as well as we thought that they would. So on average, 85% decrease in replication effect sizes. So we're not gonna get into that. Instead, we're gonna talk about what we did and the decisions that we made in the process. So one of the things we did is obviously we were focused on preclinical for a reason. We also wanted to know what paper we just arbitrarily chose the years when we designed it, 2010, 11, 12, that was our decision. Um, and that made sense because we started in 2013. We very much only wanted to focus on kind of the bread and butter, like molecular cell biochemistry experiments. So we excluded a lot of the omics experiments outside of metabolomics, got rid of all high throughput assays. And basically we're looking for in a systematic approach is what we chose by downloads, um, readership at the, at the time, which papers in the preclinical cancer space were producing noise, right? Attention to some capacity that still fit our inclusion criteria, which is they included at least one experiment that was in that molecular, you know, uh, cell um, biochemistry uh, realm of things. And then I guess not surprisingly, most of these come from nature science cell. One of the decisions we made as well is we're not going to replicate these whole papers. They're huge, right? These papers have dozens of, ex of experiments. So what we wanted to do is kind of use the paper, use the abstract to make the decision rule of which experiments to select and thus which effects from there that we were going to focus on. So that was a bit arbitrary, right? We went through all of the papers we identified. It was 50. Eventually it came to 53. There's a, a, a bit of a history there. I'm happy to, to dive into that if someone's really interested in that nuance. But what we did is we basically were saying, is there, what experiments embody the main conclusions that are written in the abstract that still fit our inclusion criteria? So we did that as a team to start, but that also got vetted during the peer review process as well. Um, what you end up getting is not like this really neat, like one paper or one experiment, you no know, one p-value line that other projects have done. Here it gets a lot messier, right? Which is one paper, many experiments occasionally, one to 11 on average or on, on the range, and then many, many potential effects, many p-values, many effect sizes that we were interested in. So a kind of messy nested structure. The other decision we made, and this is a slightly different thing that I'm talking about, which is we wanted breadth. What I mean by that is we were just looking to do one replication from many papers, many experiments, right? So we wanted as much breadth of diversity as possible. That's different than a different approach we could have taken which is, oh, I'm gonna take a given experiment and get depth. I want lots of variation of the ways to do that single experiment. So that's like the many lab style you can get, right? Which is maybe you have three different labs do the exact same experiment. And now you get to see how close or similar those different results are from those different labs, all trying to do the same thing. We chose the breadth in this project again by design. All right, I'm gonna go through this because I think this is really useful. I've done this before for those that have seen this. Um, it just kind of really sets the stage, I think. I'm gonna talk about it very differently now. So like I said, first we started, what were the key conclusions from the abstract? So that's how we defined it. We started with the paper, trying to say, okay, great. Here we crowdsourced it, that was our approach. So I'll give you an example of that. But basically we engaged uh, interested grad students and postdocs who were willing to help us 
sift through the papers from the selected experiments and say, can you help us figure out to the best of your knowledge, which what was actually being done in the paper? So a lot of the early stuff we did that we outlined was, was crowdsourced, which was um, a, a nice experience. Also kind of daunting. It showed us that it wasn't just us seeing a hard time. Uh, there were many emails I got from postdocs and grad students saying, oh, this is impossible. How do we do this? I stopped reading methods a long time ago, which to me is really was really a, a good illustration of how challenging this was going to be. We then um, contracted with Science Exchange. So there was a lot of different labs, different types. Um, we'll go a little bit more into detail there later, but that was a big piece. A lot of back and forth. We as the coordination team managed that, um, trying to make sure that we were documenting everything. Then that eventually got compiled into a standardized report. And that got peer reviewed and then that got moved on um, if that was accepted to actually get conducted. And again, we'd do, follow the same process, trying to standardize everything as much as possible. So on average, this is how long everything took. We kind of think about this in bins. Um, and again, we see that we lost the number of papers over time. So again, I'm not gonna dwell on that. That's kind of an outcome, but the challenges we encountered um, kind of increased the length of things and also increased the cost. So we ended up actually decreasing what we could do. But you can see that this is the average time on weeks to design. So that was you know, starting with the paper, trying to identify the, um, what was actually done originally to be able to get to the point where we could actually have a registry report. So that includes all back and forths with the authors, spilling in all the details with the replicating labs, all of that kind of stuff occurred in the design stage. Uh, that's the average peer review time period for the registered report. Then we also had our um, prep stage. So even though we were ready to go, we always had to make sure that we could, you know, make sure that we could order all materials. Um, usually that meant like the animals, right? Making sure we could get those in house until we actually had approval. Because again, as you can see, not every single one was approved. Then we had varying in length in terms of how long the experiments conducted. Some of this is because the experiments were very long by design. Some of those because there were challenges. So we had experiments that went really quickly and some that went incredibly long. Um, after that was done, assuming we completed everything, uh, we would do the analysis and writing stage. And then you'd see that last peer review stage. So this kind of summarizes collectively what we had throughout the entire project. So it took a long time. So what are, the, what are some things I want to share? So one is uh, it really helped um, for us to have a standard, standardized approach to designing and reporting. So we used the registered reports format to help us. And we also would have um, Google Forms and thus you know, a lot of different outputs when we were collaborating with these volunteers to code the original papers. And so what that looks like, just in case people have seen it, which is on the left is what the paper looks like. On the right is essentially what you get as a document that we would start as a first draft. We kept all of the drafts of these for all of the um, essentially uh, asks of the original authors. And then we basically begin compiling at that stage, started with the volunteers and then engaged back and forth with the labs, hopefully with the authors, getting to the point of actually creating that first registered report, which is what we intended to do. I'll give an example at the end of kind of some details of what that looked like. Um, and just, you know, I've shared this before, but like this was the big problem, which is when we were gauging the authors, we basically had to make assumptions. And so this is, I guess, um, a big lesson learned. Uh, not sure what I do otherwise. Like, you know, the alternative was to stop doing experiments. But we chose instead to say, unless there was some reason we couldn't proceed, and there definitely were examples where the authors could stop us from proceeding, like saying, recreate a mouse model that would take you years and who knows how much money. We would pretty much always try to go forward uh, in good faith. Uh, and again, we had a peer review to try to hold us accountable that we weren't making uh, big deviations, but we also tried to document every single change that we knew we were making. I'm sure there were a lot of changes we didn't know we were making because of lack of information. Okay. We also, like I said, collaborated with a lot of different labs. So overall, by the end of the project, we had 48 different labs playing a role. Um, we never let a lab be involved more than three times throughout the entire project. So there are a couple labs that played a role on three different replication attempts, but we never went past that. So most would only occur on one. The reason for that is we didn't want it to be about the individual lab. We wanted it to be about what the experiments were. So we made again this dis dis uh, design decision to say, let's minimize the influence of any individual lab, just so that we don't get some weird effect that would you know potentially compound how we interpret the results. And we did look at the type of facilities that were used. So there's academic shared resource facilities, right? So these are housed within universities, or we would have these contract research organizations, independent entities that would you, basically you pay for. Pharma uses them quite a bit. 
Uh, we did look at this to see if there was a difference. You can see it's roughly split. Um, no real difference between the two in terms of the outcomes that we were looking at. So the reason there is some people thought, oh, maybe CROs and academic shared labs have different quality standards. Uh, our data doesn't suggest that there is. To us, it was just more of an ability to find through the network at Science Exchange who is the best technical expertise to perform the research. Uh, and again, sometimes it'd be just one lab for the whole project. Sometimes it'd be many. That was just the technical decision that we had to do, which is we need a certain technical expertise to perform certain types of experiments or analyses. Okay, as I mentioned, there's lots of different data. So we chose, again, if you go back, I'll use this just because Tracy, you raised it. If you go back to the um, Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative there, they, uh, Lavo and team chose just a certain types of experiments. We didn't care outside of the big omics ones that I was talking about or anything in the clinical space. So that meant we have a lot of diversity in ours. Uh, you can. This was just a way to kind of bend the techniques, um, kind of gives you a depth of the, this is of the papers that we attempted to do, right? Not the ones that we actually completed. Um, so of these, and if you look at the, this is a, a, a standardized like category, subcategory approach. You can see a lot of these do hang out in the cell culture space, right? Western blots are pretty heavily used in a lot of animal care experiments as well. But this gives you a bit of the range, right? Yes, there were a lot of these tried and true PCR, Western blot, right? Uh, transduction techniques that were used. Uh, but we had a lot of different types of experimentations that we were hunting for in terms of expertise. And then in order to help us kind of make sense of all this, we chose to use a pro the OSF to kind of help us project manage in terms of the outputs. The reason there is we knew and we did that we were going to flip all this open. So we used OSF um, <clears throat> kind of to organize everything. Uh, I'll give you an example again of how it looked for an individual project, but we'd use that to house all the, the information, but also house each individual replication in a standardized way. <laughs> and then at the end, you can see there on the right, and again, I get links. That also allowed us then to surface it all and kind of an, or, a, hopefully a, an easier way to look at what results we actually found if someone's looking for an individual uh, replication result. We also linked it to in the paper. So again, I'll get there in a second, what, I, what we did. Um, now, as the coordinating team, you know, we're the ones that kind of try to keep an eye. So we, again, back to the, third slide that I was showing you. Uh, we managed the timelines, a small core group of us as coordinators. Uh, we managed a lot of the correspondence, so we wouldn't have a lab that was replicating, interact with authors, for example, on their own. We'd always facilitate that. That was a design design decision again. Uh, in fact, it was a design decision just to reach the authors, uh, attempt to reach them. We also managed the budget. I'm not going to get into that, but the, one of the papers kind of you know, breaks that out, and our data does keep track of it, which is we kept track of all of our budget costs throughout the whole project. That's very interesting, by the way, to do. Um, we tried to keep track of all the deviations, like I said, that we knew we were doing, just to make sure that we could be really transparent about that. And then as the coordination team, we did the bulk of the analysis, the writing, and that handled all the peer review as well. And again, we're, we're a bunch of humans, right? This is really what's going on. There's a lot of human movement in here. So we're trying our hardest to minimize human error by standardizing as much as possible. So here's an example of kind of how these things would look. So. And this is, we had a, a, we followed the registry report process, but ever so slightly different because we published multiple papers for each one. So we'd have a stage one introduction, you know, the method, what we proposed to do. So I'll show you some screenshots of what that looks like in depth. Uh, when we, if we got through and finished the actual experimentation, then we'd have another stage two, which would have a new introduction. It would have a modified methods. So again, we'd reference back what we were doing. We'd have results discussion. We'd have a deviation section as well, All right? So you get this final manuscript. And so you can see, like, basically what we did for as many as we could is we'd have an original paper, a registry report detailing all of the um, methods in a standardized format, and then a replication study doing the exact same thing in a standardized format. So these were incredibly, like, more technically written papers um, than your kind of traditional research paper. So here's an example, right? So we'd list out in the registry report all the methods. We try to keep track of the manufacturer that we were doing, uh, the catalog numbers including any notes um, of if either is unspecified or if there are any deviations. So we're going to try to keep track of everything that we could. Try to do it up front as much as possible. Uh, same thing with the procedures. We'd lay it out kind of detailed, a little bit more like a protocol paper would do. Um, except for in here, we'd have uh, certain notes that would deviate, talk about like things that were deviated from others. Um, this is also a chance where we started having to do a job as best we could of introducing other aspects of rigor. So even if the original paper, for example, didn't do randomization, we would make sure we incorporated and we to specify what that randomization looked like. So this was kind of the fun part, I think, of actually thinking through how to introduce rigor without deviating, devi 
deviating too much from the original paper. Um, and the same thing with power calculations, right? We'd always list out all of our assumptions in terms of what we had to do for the original papers. A lot of these were estimated from graphs, which is really annoying. Um, but we'd sit there and specify the different assumptions we're making and how we arrived at our sample size and, our, and thus our analysis strategy. And again, like we'd organize everything in OSF. So this is just the registry report stage. So here, a lot of this would be on our protocols and our power calculations for the most part. Then when we completed the paper, we basically got the labs to, to upload all of their content. Um, and that included the quality control aspects. Like here, this is just HPLC of a specific type of peptide analysis that was needed to make sure that it was uh, the right purity that we wanted. We would have a lot of different reports that would occur, including just written hand notebooks. We decided early on it was not going to be possible to um, hold everyone accountable within the project across all these different labs to following a similar um, methodology of documentation. So it's like, like um, agreeing everyone will use the same electronic lab notebook. Instead, we allowed variation and just said the only rule you had was to upload everything that you did. So we had a lot of interesting um, ways of, of doing that. Some people who used electronic lab notebooks a lot of people who were still using handwritten notebooks, but we'd have them upload it. Same thing with all the CSV files of our data outputs. We'd make sure that was all uploaded, our analysis files, right, our image files. So basically, we get to the point where we organize everything the same way on the project. And we did this because all these projects were occurring at the same time. So we had to really keep track of how every project was organized on OSF so that way we could always go back, say, months later and keep an eye on what exact files were uploaded and what were not uploaded. So this it was our attempt uh, of organizing it and holding ourselves accountable, um, designing it on the front end and then keeping an eye on it throughout the entire project. And so then what you'd get is you'd get this final record right on, on um, OSF of like, here we go, here's everything that we have organized in the way that we believe is sensible and that's done consistently across all of our different projects. So when we wrote our methods in the final replication paper, um, again, this is us trying to model it, we would write the brief um, summary of what we did. That's what the, the journal wanted from us, right? Which is, hey, can you write your methods again? Summarize your methods. We're like, oh, geez, well, we just told you our methods in the first paper and everything's on OSF. So we started this practice where we would summarize the key features of it. And then we always link to the actual protocol file. So that way, um, if anyone wanted to know the, exactly how the dose was administered, we'd send them a link directly to the methods for that on OSF. We do it over and over again, right? Kind of like a little bit of nausea, but it was meant to kind of create this guiding mechanism to the exact components and files on OSF. So here is tunnel analysis. It will tell you where to go for the images, where to go for the um, positive and negative controls, and where to go for the original counts, the CSV file. So that way we try to really keep it at everyone's fingertips as much as possible. Same thing with the statistical analysis, right? Try to point to all the files that we knew were gonna be important. And that meant even when we were writing the paper, here's just like an example of, and again, um, don't fight me too much on why we did our visualization uh, with bar graphs. We know that's wrong. We did it to make it equal to the original. That was a design decision. We would show it multiple ways, but we'd still do the representative images. Our goal here was to make it look, our papers look identical to the original in terms of the way they were presented. So that way it was really just about the results, not the presentation style. Um, we try to minimize that. But we knew we wanted to show all the files. So even in our figure legends, we tell somebody, well, go here for all the files. Right, go here for all the experimental details, again, trying to get at their fingertips. So that way we were showing every single image file, for example, in this case. Okay, that was a lot. I think, um, yep, I'm about at the 30 minute mark, which is what you wanted. So some lessons learned. So um, and again, I'm happy to go into more details. First thing is that things take longer than, than expected. Um, we didn't have a pandemic mess us up and it still took a lot longer than we expected. Part of it is because that transparency part that we had um, really was a blocker to us. It made it really hard for us to, to figure out what to do when we were trying to design these experiments. Um, a decision that we made, I still think it's the right one, um, but I, I keep debating on this is, yes, it was right to engage the original authors. So I'm not against that. I think it'd be interesting to do it without their help. What became a hard part was not having a strict timeline, right? We didn't want to make it overly strict because we knew everyone was really busy. So what would happen is sometimes it would take months to get this back and forth to occur in terms of um, essentially you get like a leading email. Oh, wait, 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 let me talk to the grad student that did the work at the time. Then we check in a month later or weeks later and we're like, oh, did you get in touch with the grad student? He's like, oh, no, 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 wait, I got, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked because I've got papers and grants to write. Let me get, let me try again. And we kind of just keep doing this round and round. 
and you end up still end up having to make assumptions on the back end. And that seemed kind of a little bit wasteful in hindsight. Um, the other thing that I think I would do differently is we designed everything hoping it was going to work out just fine, right? Um, introducing pilots or optimization where the authors told us, but not overdoing it. Um, I would I would not do that again. I would actually completely pilot everything. I would just focus on the controls to start. Get an experimental system to run. Don't even bother with the rest of the experiment because a lot of the issues we had were the experimental systems not behaving the same way. And if I had realized that, we would have done it more of like a tiered approach, right? First, see if you can get the experimental system to work. After that works, then try and see if you can actually, you know, conduct the experiment in terms of whatever the uh, hypothesis being tested is before what we did is jump to it. And then possibly even there, think about how much deviation we're willing to allow, right? Um, another way to say that, we spent a lot of time trying to optimize experiments that we thought were already optimized for us. And in the in hindsight, it would have been better just to say, okay, how much effort, how much money, how much time are we going to put towards something trying to optimize the conditions, the experimental system, before we just kind of give up and say, no, no, we're not going to do this anymore. That's that is a lesson learned right there, which is this is taking too much time to get a system to work. The system is not optimized. What I mean by system here, by the way, is I'm trying to be a little bit vague because it has a lot of different meanings. A lot of the times it could be like having an animal model of a disease, right? And you're saying, okay, well, how long does it take to have disease presentation present, right? How, what's the tumor burden look like over the course of time? Like we should have done a lot more of that on the front end because it was not really handed to us as neatly as we thought. Okay, another lesson learned. In our whole process, it's really important that we were transparent constantly, um, right from the beginning, right? Saying we're gonna replicate, you know, experiments from 50 papers. In the end, we ended up not being able to replicate all of those. I think that was really important. It was hard. It meant that we had to constantly keep um, keeping ourselves accountable to the decisions we were making and why we were or were not um, uh, able to do certain things. Uh, I would constantly get asked um, by certain uh, you know, news reporters, uh, especially in like Science Nature, that were kind of following us. They'd always be wanting to know, like, what's your update? What's your update? What's your update? Um, and it, that's part of it, right? When you make a project very transparent, I think on the front end, you have to be prepared constantly to answer those questions. Uh, but that's a fun thing, right? Because it also means on the back end, when we're publishing these papers, we're hoping ourselves to imitate what we believe should be the more you know norm within the community, which is open everything up as much as possible. Throughout the project, we had to constantly, as I was just describing, kind of figure out these trade-off balances. Uh, we had a lot of resources, but not infinite resources. So we had to constantly, while the whole project was being done, make these decisions of which experiments where we were just going to say, hmm, We've been spinning our wheels on this. We're not going to be able to complete this with the funds we have versus which ones are we going to invest more of our time to try to finish. So there was a constant decision making. So it basically meant we influenced what could get finished essentially by how much resources we had available to us. And we did thankfully have a lot, but um, it just shows you how, I guess, how much more you need to do a project that we wanted to, to do at the, the beginning of it. And I think the big thing is it's really important to have support. So this was a project that was done by a lot of different people. Um, even just that core coordinating team, there's a big chunk of us that spent a lot of time really constantly being able to do that. And that I think allowed us to kind of use the resources of the grad students, the postdocs who helped us with the um, coding that was done and with all of this, you know, science exchange labs. Because here, the, our project was just a part of their work versus for the rest of the coordinating team was the bulk of what our work was. Um, and the thing that I think that's really cool is, is everyone takes something different away. Um, you know, it's... It, looking back on the, right, the eight years of doing that, it is really interesting to, to see how some people really enjoyed, I think, the whole process of, oh my gosh, this is a cool way of doing science, um, you know, an attempt, who cares what the result is, it was just fun to be so transparent about the process, to others who I think very much saw through this process how nearly, how really impossible it was to attempt it, right, how little transparency there was and how frustrating that was to them, and I think this Kind of allowed me to kind of think through how everyone that was involved in the product had a very different takeaway and that's really kind of the point right the point's not to have like a single learn lesson it's to allow many lessons so i'll end um with first this which is all the people that actually contributed to it so these are all the researchers that had a role including the project coordinators that played a critical role in terms of just enabling this to occur and then i've put links throughout but these slides are always available i'll try to make everything that i can open as much as possible and a couple more links, including my own contact info.